right, so uh, just a continuation from the first part. So uh, a tragedy. We talked about a tragic hero yesterday and a tragic flaw, but we didn't really talk about what a tragedy is. So in modern times, a tragedy is something that happens that's terrible or sad. Uh, in Shakespearean Elizabethan times, a tragedy is a play in which the main character suffers a downfall. In most tragedies, the main characters are in some ways responsible for their downfall. So this is what kind of connects to a tragic hero or a tragic flaw. Uh, we talked about how it was kind of connected to hubris and that the tragic hero makes this mistake, whether it's overconfidence or just bad judgment. And it leads to, you know, most likely their death. Uh, but the difference is they they are able to kind of reflect upon it and they can face this tragic flaw, this downfall uh, with, with honor. They don't shy away from it. They accept that they made a bad decision and they move forward or they accept their fate. So there's six elements to a tragedy. There's the plot, which we talked about already. Diction, language, and dialogue, which we've touched upon a little bit. Music and rhythm, theme, spectacle, and character. So we talked about the five parts of the plot already, and it's pretty much what happens in the play. This is our entire story from start to end. The elements of tragedy, the playwright's words, choices, and the actor's uh, enunciation while delivering the lines. So diction, language, and dialogue, it's not just what is said, but pretty much how things are said and uh, the way that they are delivered. And pretty much uh, there's emphasis on certain words. So that kind of gives us an idea of, of character motivations, character, char indirect characterizations, and pretty much uh, gives us an idea of a certain type of irony. Uh, it's a, it's, I'm trying to, re trying to uh, remember. It's a dramatic irony where we kind of have an idea of what's happening, but the characters may not know. So music and rhythm, not music as we think, but rather the sound rhythm and melody of the speeches. So what you might see in, in some in some parts, so these are uh, there's parts where characters, only one character will be on stage and they will be giving what seems to be this long speech. These are called monologues. And sometimes, most of the time when a character is doing a monologue, they'll speak in a sort of rhythm or a, a sort of rhyme. So there'll be some sort of pattern to their speech when they actually deliver it to the audience. This is more prevalent, obviously, in the, the Shakespearean original text. Uh, so when I, when I actually upload the text, it will be the No Fear version, where we have both the original text and the modernized English. So we'll be able to look back and forth uh, on the modern and Shakespearean English. And then there's the theme, which we've already kind of gone over what themes are over and over and over again, especially at the very beginning of the year when we did the five people you meet in heaven. It's what a play means. It's what what's the, the lesson that we learn from it, as opposed to, you know, what's really happening. It's what can we learn from this, this story? The spectacle, which is the scenery, costumes, and special effects in the play. This is the what creates the atmosphere. This is kind of the special effects. Uh, this is kind of the visual aids that help us uh, uh, understand and enjoy the, the play a lot more. And then the characters, which is the person or people that an actor represents in the play. So Romeo and Juliet is based on a long narrative poem by Arthur Brooke, which was published in 1562. And it was based on popular Italian stories. So Romeo and Juliet, not necessarily, uh, Shakespeare didn't steal it, but he found inspiration to write Romeo and Juliet from this poem. So in Romeo and Juliet, Romeo was a very young man. Juliet was a 14-year-old girl. They fell in love at first sight. And that's one of the big themes. That's one of the things that we can learn is that they were caught up in this idealized, almost unrealistic uh, love. It's like they were almost in love with the, with the, fa uh, the thought or the thing of being in love. So um, well, I'm just going to address this real quick. Yes, Juliet was a 14-year-old girl. Romeo was said to be in his late teens. Uh, and we know age differences. And in, uh, in Shakespearean times, this was a lot more, I guess, accepted. There, there wasn't that uh, the modernized laws that we have now. So, you know, obviously today this wouldn't really fly. Today, whenever this story is kind of retold in more modernized uh, formats, they either make Romeo younger or they make Juliet more older to kind of go along with uh, our society's laws. So... Well, I, like I mentioned yesterday as well, star-crossed lovers. So this is um, pretty much what they are are kind of representing, what they kind of are. They're doomed to, to disaster by fate. So in Shakespeare's time, they, he actually believed in astrology. So he believed that, uh, that Romeo and Juliet were these different zodiac signs that shouldn't really mesh well together.